My fiance died a month before our wedding date. It was the kind of freak accident that you would see on Final Destination, and her injuries were not just, of course, fatal, but disfiguring as well. I had to identify her body, and she was unrecognizable from the waist up. The only reference I had to confirm her identity was a tattoo she had on the outside of her right thigh, two butterflies with their wings interlocked. The butterflies were meant to represent us. She got it the day after we announced our engagement. I had stood looking over the ruin of her body, marveling at the fact that this collection of organs and skin and blood had once been my beloved. She had survived so much only to be brought down by a tragic chain of events. And I couldn't help but think of a quote from Terry Pratchett. When someone is saved from certain death by a strange concatenation of circumstances, they say that's a miracle. But of course, if someone is killed by a freak chain of events, the oil spilled just there, the safety fence broken just there, that must also be a miracle. Just because it's not nice doesn't mean it's not miraculous. It was indeed miraculous. A horrible miracle devised by an insane god. And of course I was sad. She had been a lovely woman, and I had loved her very much. But her death had solved an awkward predicament I'd been mulling over for a while. I had been wondering how I could call the wedding off. Before I go any further, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. I know what people are like, and I understand everyone reading this will probably assume I orchestrated her death. I did not. I loved her, fervently once upon a time, more absently in the past years, and I had no wish for her to die. I just didn't want to marry her, for reasons I will explain presently. But her death was the result of such an odd set of circumstances that anyone who could have plotted and put that plan into action would have to be a god themselves. It happened like this. My fiance, I will call her M for the purposes of this tale, was attending a final wedding dress fitting. I of course had not seen the dress, but I saw the shreds of the fabric clinging to her wounds on the day I was called to identify her. It was completely her, wispy and sparkling, and floaty, so very her. Anyway, it transpired that the boutique she was purchasing the dress from had only one member of staff in attendance, and whilst ordinarily she would have had people to help her into the dress, the one staff member had to leave M in order to take care of other business. Before she had left, she had locked the shop door so nobody would be able to come in whilst she was gone. Eager to try on her wedding dress, M had apparently attempted to put it on alone. Most of the following events have been put together by eyewitnesses, the coroner, and CCTV footage, but it appears that M, my sweet, clumsy bride, had somehow gotten stuck in the dress. It was a tricky piece of clothing, according to the traumatized shop assistant, with a lace-up corset back and a number of ties and straps besides, tangled in the confines of the dress. Hands over her head and face covered, M had stumbled from the changing room seeking help. The dress was quite heavy despite its floaty appearance, and it's possible she panicked. The CCTV shows her bumping into a side table and falling over, the vase on the table toppling and a considerable amount of water tipping onto the dress fabric. The inquest that followed her death suggested that the water on the fabric over her face would have produced a suffocating effect, like waterboarding, and from her struggles to free herself it was clear she was in some distress. It was heartbreaking to watch. That's not what killed her, however. M had managed to get herself into a sitting position and, using her arms, presumably get the wet material off her face. She always was a fighter. From there, she managed to get to her feet somehow, flopping around like a salmon until she was upright and make her way into the main room of the boutique looking for assistance. She did find her way to the door, but it was locked. Of course, she had to have been exhausted by then. She tottered here and there, a zigzag path of despair that the soulless eye of the camera recorded, and by some horrible miracle managed to bump into the full-length mirror angled against the wall. M wasn't a heavy woman, but she fell heavily, and the mirror shattered into a multitude of potentially deadly shards which flew everywhere. Everyone watching the footage winced in unison, I recall, as the jagged glass exploded around her. The mirror shards didn't kill her either. On the contrary, they freed her. The fabric of the dress got sliced in such a way she was able to push her face free. And although she couldn't be heard gasping for air, she could be seen gulping lungfuls of it. There was blood on the dress, and it was ruined. But such was her relief that she was seen to smile, lying there on her back in the abandoned boutique surrounded by the jagged glitter of the destroyed mirror. 
She checked her arms and ran her newly released hands over her face and seemed to find no drastic injuries, which the inquest somehow managed to confirm. We saw her laugh then. She always had the most exuberant laugh, very infectious. Her relief was greater than the demise of the dress, and no doubt she was rehearsing the story of what had occurred in order to report back to me later. I'm always had a talent at looking on the bright side, and at recounting tales of her misadventures in the most amusing way possible. It might have ended there, a funny anecdote of what happened to her on the day of her final dress fitting, a story we might have told our children, but here is where the miracle occurred. It was a bright, sunny day. The boutique was coincidentally positioned so that it got the full benefit of the natural light, and somehow, through some bizarre twist of fate, the sunshine happened to fall upon a large mirror shard in such a way that it reflected back into the eyes of a passing lorry driver. The poor man approached me at N's funeral. He had not recovered from his part in her death. He apologized to me over and over, but I could not accept any apologies from him. It had been an accident, a terrible, miraculous accident, and he had as much control over it as M had had over her non-stop laughter. Temporarily blinded, the driver had hit another car, and upon feeling the impact had tried to swerve. As a result, the huge vehicle had crashed through the storefront, mowing down the white-clad displays in the window and had not stopped its momentum until its front wheels had crushed the life from my fiancé. So there it is. Even if I had wanted her dead, which I hadn't, there is no way on earth I could have organized such a series of events. It may be obvious from my recounting of her personality that I had some affection for her. I did. She was warm and funny and sweet. Everyone loved her. So why did I not want to marry her? That, that is the tricky part. Many of you will hate me for what I'm about to say. And I won't blame you one bit. I have never claimed to be a good person, and the fact that M fell in love with me at all is a miracle in itself. I did not deserve her. When I met M, she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Perfectly made, flawless complexion, sparkling eyes, and, it goes without saying, the most amazing boobs. Her eyes were the first to suffer. Poor M had always joked that she had unlucky disease and that it was contagious. She was clumsy, true, but that didn't account for both her parents dying in a freak accident. As unlikely as the one that had ended her, as well as a multitude of other misfortunes, had she not been such a sunny soul, I doubt her spirit could have survived such horrendous setbacks. But like I said, she was a fighter. Be careful, she had always said to me. Only half joking, I might infect you. And although she never infected me in the literal sense, I was affected by her symptoms. She lost one of her sparkling eyes to a tumor. She said it went against her luck to have caught the tumor early enough for it to be removed. But she also said that even tragedies can have their high points. After all, Romeo and Juliet may have died, but at least they had married before that. M got a replacement glass eye. It matched the original very well, but I always knew it wasn't real. That wasn't too much of a problem in itself, as long as I didn't think about it too much. But then came the news that she had breast cancer, and a double mastectomy took away both of those amazing assets. Her hair fell out from the chemotherapy, but it grew back. Her breasts did not, and because her face was still beautiful, I could almost ignore the twin scars on her chest. Almost, she talked about implants as if it were a happy daydream and I was only too glad to humor her, but somehow she never seemed too bothered about replacing her breasts. I thought she could have done that for me. The final straw came when it was discovered that the tumor she had lost an eye to had returned and poked its evil little fingers into her face. She lost part of her face then, too much, in my opinion. The right side of her face remained flawless, but the left side. It reminded me of childhood nightmares. I hated to look at it. I never told her as much. I acted my role well, but I only ever kissed the good side of her face from there on. I know you will all be judging me now, but imagine your own loved one with half their formerly lovely face transformed into a mask of scar tissue and twisted flesh. It looked like a piece of fruit with a section taken out, the section replaced by a gnarled and warped knot of toughened skin. Would you eat that fruit? I still loved her but I did not desire her anymore. I participated in the wedding plans, but my heart was not in it. I could not imagine lifting the veil to kiss my bride and seeing the horror beneath. It was a travesty. Her death was a tragedy, but it also solved my problem. 
I had not wanted to hurt her, and now I would not. I was released. Her family wanted an open casket funeral. I was against it, of course, but they were paying. I couldn't imagine the work the mortuary team would have to do to render M palatable for public viewing. But when I went to see the final results the day before the funeral, I was astonished. They had performed miracles. Working from old photos, they had pieced my fiancé back together in a process. That must have been as harrowing as it was painstaking. In fact, they had done so while they had restored her back to her former beauty, before the cancer had sunk its malignant teeth into her perfect flesh. Her face was flawless, the scar tissue, and gnarled skin on the left side had been reconstructed so skillfully she looked the way she had done the day I had met her. And under the demure bosom of her funeral gown, above her folded hands, two rounded domes rose where her breasts had once been. She was breathtaking again, and I fell in love with her all over again. I know you will think me insane and perverse, but I couldn't bear to think of that perfection being lowered into a hole and covered in dirt to rot underground. I had to take her back. I won't go into details. It wasn't an easy job breaking into the funeral home and stealing her corpse, but I managed it. She was heavier in death than she had been in life, as if the mere act of being alive had imbued some buoyancy in her that death had taken away. But it was worth it. I had my beautiful M back in our home again, for however long she lasted, the day of her funeral would have been the day of our wedding. I went to the church with a suitably long face, and looked appropriately horrified when the news of her missing body spread. I even managed to break down so convincingly I was escorted home. I turned down offers of company by stating that I needed to be alone, all the while knowing that M was lying upstairs in what would have been in our marital bed even as I turned well-wishers away from our door. In fact, I couldn't wait to be upstairs with my love again and consummate our displaced wedding. But here's the thing, when I dashed upstairs, removing my stuffy suit as I went, I found that the bed was empty, the covers were thrown back, and there were some unsavory looking stains on the white sheets that I did not want to examine too closely, but no M. I backed out of the room, doing my shirt back up as I went, and closed the bedroom door. I can't be sure, but I think I saw that the door to the walk-in closet was slightly ajar and I was certain I had slid it fully closed earlier after fetching my suit. As I write this, I am sitting downstairs, listening to heavy thuds coming from the bedroom. Whoever is up there seems to be bumping into a lot of things. I know I was clumsy in life, but I also know that undertakers use spiked eye caps in order to keep the eyes of a corpse closed, and M had only one good eye to begin with. The thumps do seem to be getting closer to where I judge the door to be though. I think I've made a terrible mistake. 